Hi all, uh, thank you for the invite to come here today. I'm delighted to, to be able to talk to you about uh, something that uh, I think we should all do more of, which is uh, to get out there and uh, to walk. So I, I think over the last sort of 20 years or so, we've got a, a, a very new view of how walking is important and I mean really central to uh, uh, human behavior and, and uh, central to our health. Uh, this is a kind of an old quote from John Napier, who's a, an anthropologist. And it's only half right, in my view. Uh, he says, human walking is a risky business. Without split-second timing, man would fall flat on his face. In fact, with each step he takes, he teeters on the edge of the catastrophe. And just below, we have the Minister for City Walks. And uh, <laughs> what's interesting about this walk is uh, that he's able to nod to somebody while doing something uh, which is actually precarious and can continue to walk very, very well. And this is because evolution has actually designed this remarkably well uh, for walking and has been doing this for a very, very long time. Uh, so what I'll talk about first briefly is just what we know about the evolution of walking. Now, as land dwellers, uh, we usually think walking probably evolved on land. And, but we now know that that view is not correct. Uh, and we only know that from work over the last uh, literally two or three years. Um, if you look at so-called benthic organisms, uh, animals that live on the, the floor of the ocean. You get lovely creatures like this. This is the uh, rosy-lipped blackfish. Um, and you can see that it has limbs that it walks on on the ocean floor. Uh, and you also have this gorgeous little guy, uh, the sea pig. These live in ocean trenches, and uh, they eat waste, um, of uh, organic waste of every type and stripe. Uh, they're transparent. And they walk along on these uh, limbs, and they do that very, very effectively. And a good question, and we can do this now, or answer this question now with uh, the, the latest generation of, of genomic tools, is to ask what's the relationship between the walking that these kinds of animals engage in and the walking that uh, land animals engage in. So here's a, a, an example of how you go about answering a question like this. This is a skate. Uh, I'm sure you've all eaten one at some point. This is a, a view from below, and they walk along um, using these hind limbs, and they swim with these, these uh, uh, fins on here, and they, they move very, very well. And on the, the right here, we have uh, a couple of friendly mice who should be walking, and uh, regrettably are not. <laughs> um, and the question that we can answer now is, do the genes that control the walking in this guy resemble in any way the walking in a mouse. Uh, the skate has a pair of hips. Uh, these legs extend from the hips. Uh, they're innervated into the spinal cord, and they've got an articulated set of muscles that allow them to push against uh, the surface of the, the, uh, uh, the sea or the sea bottom and push themselves along. And of course, mice have a kind of a similar kind of arrangement, a spinal cord with bilateral limbs that extend out and touch the ground. And what you find when you compare the genes that control the expression of uh, uh, legs and leg movement in the uh, tetrapod, which is a, a name for a four-limbed four animal that uh, walks on the, on, the, on the ground, or on the land, and in the skate, is that they are indeed the same. The only difference is that the mouse has an insertion that effectively allows it to double up the number of limbs. So it's got a hind limb and four limbs. So the conclusion is a very straightforward one, um, that walking had to have evolved under the sea, because the last common ancestor of the mouse and the skate can be dated to around about 420 million years ago, uh, which is really a, a considerable uh, period of time. And this upsets the old view that uh, walking evolved uh, at the margins of, of uh, the water. Uh, now, what do we know about walking on land? Well, the, the name tetrapod is given to the very earliest uh, four-limbed animals that walked on land. And uh, there are tetrapod trackways in, in a very few locations in the world. Uh, there's one on this island, that, or on, uh, not, sorry, on an island off this island, Valencia Island. Um, and there are two others. There's one in Poland, and there's another one, I think, in Brazil. And uh, there's uh, Valencia down on the uh, coast of, of uh, Kerry. And if you haven't been to see this, I really recommend that it. it's, uh, it's a lovely walk to go there. Uh, you have to go down a, a cliff path. And uh, uh, these footprints extend along what was a, a, the bed of a, a dried out river uh, in quite a
quite a few meters in several directions. And the animal, uh, from the calculations that you can do on uh, the footprints that are left here, uh, is approximately of these kinds of dimensions, uh, and it must have been an amphibian, so it was capable of, of uh, walking on land and, and breathing air for short periods of time. And we don't know what it was doing, uh, and we don't have any fossils uh, for this. All we have is what's known as the trace fossil, the footprints it left behind. Now, moving from two feet to four feet is something that human, or four limbs to two limbs is something that humans do. And it, it's a very strange thing that humans do. It's unlike a, a transition that's made by any other uh, animal in the animal kingdom. Um, and uh, why is it strange? Well, when you're on four limbs and you're crawling around, you're in a very, very stable position from which it's very difficult to fall. And if you do fall, you're not going to fall very far. Uh, whereas at around about the age of 12 months or so, you start to make what's known as an obligate transition. And this is something that, in the course of normal development, assuming everything is going normally for you, uh, if you've had prior crawling experience as a child, you will flop yourself back onto your bum and eventually you'll start to pull yourself against things and you'll start to walk around. And this is a tremendously difficult thing for a child to learn to do. And we forget, because we have no memories ourselves, of how difficult it was to learn how to walk. Um, and how do we do it? Well, this is how we do it. Uh, this title of this paper summarizes it perfectly. Uh, you take thousands of steps and dozens of falls per day. If you uh, kit out a laboratory to examine toddlers as they're learning to walk, you can create something like this. You've got a gate net, and you've got cameras that track the uh, movement that the, uh, the toddler makes as it's moving around at around the age of 12 or 14 months. And what you see is something that should put every adult to shame. And it's this, that the locomotor experience that the average 12 to 19 month old engages in is absolutely enormous. They walk around about 2,300 steps per hour. Uh, and they have an average of about 17 falls per hour. But these falls are non-injurious. So this is a really, again, remarkable factor or uh, feature of uh, human walking. Uh, that you can have these many falls, and yet you persist in the behavior where you sculpt your spinal cord so that you're now in a vertical and somewhat unstable position, and humans can do it. And humans can do something amazing after this. Uh, they can engage in walking in very, very difficult and uh, rough uh, terrain. And here's an example. Um, you see this guy here is kitted out with a mobile laboratory, and he's walking along a uh, stony surface, and he's doing this at a reasonable speed, and he's not falling. And the question is, how do we do this? These are uh, videos and data from Mary Hayhoe's laboratory in Texas. And this is how we do it. Uh, if you watch the person as they start to move, and you measure where they're looking, what they do is gaze out about two meters and flick their eyes back to ensure that where the foot is about to be placed is stable. And you can do this at quite a high speed, uh, and, and you can do this for very, very long periods of time without injuring yourself or without falling, so long as you're not trying to go on Twitter or something <laughs> where you're engaging in the walk. And this is something that robots find enormously difficult to do. It's easier to have a tracked robot or a robot with wheels than it is to have a robot that can walk on four limbs in the same fashion that we can. And uh, this is an example of Boston Dynamics. <laughs> this is not a difficult surface for it to walk on. It's just a snowy surface with some branches. Humans can do that with great facility, uh, whereas the robot finds it very difficult to, to walk uh, in a straight line for short periods of time. And this is because it doesn't have the very long period of learning that uh, humans uh, do. Uh, there's more to it than that, though. Uh, one thing that we do very well when we're walking is we stabilize ourselves repeatedly and repetitively. Uh, and we stabilize it ourselves in a couple of different <coughs> dimensions. We obviously have to do it in a vertical dimension. But a dimension that we're not very well aware of is uh, we keep a line parallel between the corner of the eye and the auditory canal of the ear. And despite all sorts of ch changes in, in trajectory, we keep that line parallel with the ground uh, because we have a system in our inner ear, a vestibular system that allows us to measure the movement that we make and correct for that very quickly. Um, but it has a slight flaw. It causes us 
to walk in circles. And it's often said that uh, when you're lost, you do walk in circles. And actually, you do, uh, surprisingly. And how do we know this? Well, we know this by studying people who are brought out for walks in forests uh, where either they can see the sun uh, or there's very heavy cloud cover, or they're brought out to the desert uh, where either they can see the sun or the moon or there's heavy cloud cover present. And what you find when the sun is present, people walk in straight lines, but they veer according to the movement of the sun. So we calibrate our movement uh, according to the position of the sun. When cloud cover is present, we turn around on ourselves repeatedly because we can't tell once we've moved more than about 70 to 80 meters uh, whether we're moving in a straight line or not when the surface we're walking against is homogeneous. And if you blindfold people and pop them in a, an aircraft runway, this is the kind of thing you do. After about 70 or 80 meters, you walk in circles. Uh, and it doesn't matter whether you're left footed or right footed, you can't predict the circle on the basis of handedness or, or footedness. Uh, so this tells us that we need to recalibrate ourselves periodically uh, by some other input, and the one that we're most used to using is uh, vision. Now, in my book, I argue that uh, walking is very, very good for us uh, physically, but also mentally. It, it, it uh, provides all sorts of benefits for the functioning of the brain that uh, we're barely aware of. And I, I'm just going to focus on two uh, studies just to illustrate this. So this is a, a study from the US from a couple of years ago, 2016. And I, I really like this study because there are people among us who should be expelled from human existence, that uh, hate walking. Uh, expect to feel bad after a walk. Um, and what this study shows, uh, and I'll, I'll bring you through the detail of it, is that people who go for walks uh, feel good even when they expect to feel the opposite. Um, so what they did in this study is very simple. They brought people to the lab and asked them to engage in a judgment task and they were told, you're either going to look at pictures of buildings in the local town, um, or we're going to walk to those buildings, and you're going to judge the beauty of those buildings. So the, the, the comparison is the same in terms of the, the aesthetic judgment the person has to make, but the uh, uh, difference is that in the second condition, you have to engage in an incidental walk. You have to walk to the buildings to judge their beauty. And what you find is, uh, just going for a short walk increases dramatically uh, how good you feel. Um, and it does so even if in a different questionnaire previously you said that you hate walking and you expect to feel lousy afterwards. And instead what you do is you feel good. Um, so this tells us that walking can boost mood transiently. And there's lots of data showing this. But more, I think the more important social question though is uh, what effect does movement or walking have uh, on other kinds of conditions, like psychiatric conditions. So there's a very important study just recently published uh, in the American Journal of Psychiatry. Uh, uh, this is the Hunt cohort study conducted in uh, Australia. And uh, this followed uh, around about uh, 36, uh, 33, 34,000 adults over uh, uh, more than a decade, and looked at the risk of these individuals succumbing to a uh, major depressive disorder as a function of how much walking they engage in. Uh, so they break the group into cohorts and look at the likelihood that you're going to suffer from a major depressive disorder. And what they find is, is something remarkable, that um, for every level of walking above the most sedentary in the population, there's about a 12% reduction in the number of people suffering from major depressive disorder compared with what uh, was expected. So this is a really, really remarkable result. To be engaging in movement at all prospectively reduces the chance that uh, that uh, will succumb uh, to major depressive disorder. Um, and the conclusion is a very nice one. That regular leisure time exercise in any intensity provides protection against future depression. Uh, now, curiously, they didn't find that effect on anxiety. There are other people who claim that there are effects on anxiety, but here they, they don't show that. Uh, but the overall public health benefit is very straightforward. It prevents a substantial number of new cases of depression. So it's as if activity engages, or it, it acts as a, an inoculant against uh, becoming uh, depressed. 
Now, there are lots of other benefits for walking, or from walking, and one is a, uh, one for creativity. So I, I'm going to focus on a, on a local case study first, and then uh, I'm, I'm going to uh, give you a more general uh, set of uh, findings on this. Uh, so this is uh, William Rowan Hamilton, uh, Sir William Rowan, Rowan Hamilton, the, the most famous uh, Irish mathematician, and he invented uh, a complex type of mathematics called quaternions. I think the simplest thing to say about quaternions is that they are utterly alien to our everyday lives because they have implications like this. They, meet, they say that 3 plus 4 does not equal 4 plus 3, so they're non-commutative. Uh, it's a very, very different uh, kind of uh, uh, maths to the maths that people might be ordinarily used for. And they're used in all sorts of applications. If any of you use an, an electric toothbrush, uh, quaternions are used to solve the problem of dual rotation for the cleaning of tooth and the, the, the double axis of movement. And they're used in computer games, they're used in, in the video industry <coughs> very, very much. And uh, Hamilton uh, puzzled about quaternions for a very, very long period of time. And he used to walk from Dunsink in North Dublin to, to Trinity into the Royal Irish Academy <coughs> most days, a walk of about 11 kilometres. And one day, he finally figured out the solution and had forgotten to bring his pen. Uh, I'm sure many of you know this story. Uh, he had his tobacco knife, and uh, he got the solution here at Broom Bridge um, and carved the equation into a stone so he, he wouldn't forget it. And uh, he said uh, something aston astonishing. I think one of the, the best kind of quotes that I've ever come across regarding insight and creativity. Uh, here there dawned on me the notion that we must admit, in some sense, a fourth dimension of space for the purpose of calculating with triples. An electric circuit seemed to close, and a spark flashed forth, and the spark was on its quaternion. So the question then is, is this something peculiar to uh, Hamilton, or is it something more general? Uh, does walking make you more creative? And actually, um, there's been a bit of data, uh, and a few studies done on this over the, the, the last couple of years. And here's, uh, I think, one very interesting and impressive uh, study. So, a standard approach to creativity in the lab is to bring you into the lab and hand you objects. So here's a, a pen, and uh, you, your job over the next two minutes is to generate as many alternative uses for this pen as you can. And then you're given a cup and a paper clip. It doesn't matter, any uh, household object. And uh, typically these experiments are done with people just waiting and then being brought in and sat down. And uh, people will generate uh, numbers of uh, alternative uses, in this case, typically about six. However, if you make people walk for a short period of time, uh, eight to 12 minutes prior to getting them to generate alternative uses, what you see is people generate about twice as many uh, compared to uh, uh, the condition where you're merely seated. And the movement is the thing. So if you make people walk on a treadmill, you get lots of, of uh, extra ideas. If, if they're made to sit on a chair on the treadmill, you don't get these extra uh, ideas. So the answer to or the question, does will walking make you more creative? Is, I think, a tentative yes. Uh, if we look at the kind of experiences of the great artists and writers of the years, uh, uh, they will all, if you go through their biographies, you'll find that many, many of them, prior to writing uh, and prior to creative activities, will go for long now, there's a stereotype of the elderly, that uh, the people who are aging, that they become less creative. And the question is, is that true? So this is a, a great study from Taiwan, which has done exactly the same thing as was done in the, the, the study that I just mentioned. Except they took people in their early 20s and people in their, from their late 60s uh, onward. And uh, they got them to walk or not walk. And what they found is that uh, people in their late 60s and early 70s who walk generate about twice as many ideas uh, and twice as many original ideas compared to people in their early 20s who are required to sit for a, a, a period before generating alternative uses. So it seems a good way of uh, getting the kind of creative juices flowing is just to get out there and move because uh, it, it causes all sorts of changes in the activity of the brain that otherwise uh, wouldn't. Now, just because you have an idea doesn't mean that it's a good idea. This is uh, an idea that was famously decided on uh, 
uh, two years ago, which turned out to be a disaster. Now, how much do you walk? Anybody here recall the many steps you took last Thursday fortnight? If you can, you're doing it because you're looking at your phone. <laughs> um, Self-reporting and walking uh, turns out to be a, a real disaster zone for the literature. I think you can take all of the self-report data and throw it in the bin. Um, uh, it's utterly and completely unreliable. Um, and it's misleading when you compare it to the quantitative data that you grab uh, from smartphones and from smartwatches now. Um, there's a, a fantastic paper uh, published in uh, Nature last year uh, looking at about 700,000 people. And again, you can't get these kinds of numbers from the self-report data. Uh, comparing levels of walking uh, across the planet. And uh, all sorts of interesting things come out of this. First of all, people walk a lot less than they think they walk. Uh, people think they walk a lot because they remember they've been walking. But they don't remember how many steps, and their recall for the amount of time they've been walking is very poor. Um, the people who walk the most are the Japanese, typically around about 5,500 steps a day. Uh, the UK and the USA are in the middle there, as are we. Uh, and the people who walk the least are uh, the Saudi Arabians, presumably because of the, uh, the heat. Uh, and uh, you can do much more with data like this. You can look at how walkable your city is, or unwalkable uh, your city is. So in uh, the US, there are very good data on the walkability of cities. And uh, walkable cities, I'm sure you all imagine the ones in the US that are. New York, people walk everywhere. Boston, people walk. Uh, San Francisco, people walk. Very good public transport and very compact uh, urban locales. And this is what you see in a walkable city. Big spike in walking uh, from about six or seven in the morning on, a drop by people who are at work, a big spike again around lunchtime, and then a big spike in the evening of a long tail. Uh, so people walk much more in a walkable city. Uh, whereas in an unwalkable city, or a relatively poor walking city, people walk much less. And rates of, of uh, cardiac health and other indices of, of public health uh, are worse in the cities which are of low walkability. And this is for the weekday. And look at the weekends. People are much more active in your highly walkable city compared to your non-walkable uh, city. Now, uh, I'm going uh, uh, to, just uh, coming close to, to finishing up, I've just got a few more things that I just want to talk to you about. Um, when you think about how you walk, if you've got normal sight, uh, the obvious thing to think is uh, that uh, vision predominates your sense of how you navigate the world. And that's reasonable, but it's untrue, uh, remarkably so. And we know this from a, a great series of studies in people who are congenitally blind, so that is blind from birth, people who are adventitiously blind, so that they become blind later in life as the result of an accident, compared with people who are not blind, uh, who are made to wear uh, blindfolds. And if you ask people to engage in what are known as uh, root-finding tasks, or origin-finding tasks, so you walk along two limbs of a triangle, and then you walk, and you find your way back to the start. And you can change the angle here. You can do lots of different variations. Over short distances, uh, the performance of people who are blind, people who are adventitiously blind, and people who are wearing a blindfold is all approximately the same. Uh, in other words, even though it feels like it, uh, vision actually is not the single most important sense in finding our way around in the world, at least over short distances. Uh, it has to arise as a, as a result of uh, some other system. Um, uh, and this is the conclusion of this study, that uh, spatial competence strongly does not strongly depend on, on prior visual experience. What actually matters is movement in the world and being able to track your own movement in that world. And we do that using this system, the vestibular system, which keeps us upright, but also allows us to measure uh, our movement uh, at least over short distances. And this is how, if the lights were to go out here completely, uh, you would be able to find your way to the doors, even though the conditions might be completely black. But we're able to move in the absence of uh, visual input. Now, if we focus on the planet for a moment and look at demographics, uh, one of the things we see is everywhere you look, uh, 
every country, uh, people are living longer, just about. The trend line here is in orange, uh, from 1960, it's in the early, uh, the low 50s, uh, to a couple of years ago, uh, 2015, it's around about 72. You can see here at the top, the Japanese, again, are uh, up at around 84, 85, and, and, uh, but the, the overall trend uh, is heading in the same direction. And this is really, really uh, a remarkable thing that's happened in, in, uh, when you look back over the, the history of, of humanity. A hundred years ago, life expectancy was much, much lower uh, than this. Now, and this, I think, brings us to a central problem in our cities and towns, and it's this. Uh, the design features of our cities and towns generally do not facilitate people to walk. Um, but they also cause a particular problem for older pedestrians who have mobility impairment. So this is, a, 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 I think, a really important study uh, in the UK from uh, a couple of years ago. And uh, what they do is focus on how easily older pedestrians uh, can make it across the road in the time uh, that the typical road engineer allows for uh, the person to cross uh, the road. And the conclusion is really terrible, I think. Uh, what they say is this is a study of about 3,000 people. 84% um, of males tested and 94% of females tested had a walking impairment um, because they walk below the speed at which crossing points are set for the average uh, or, I mean, by uh, low traffic engineers, which is a speed of about 1.2 meters uh, a second. Those speeds need to come down. Uh, they need to be probably a meter a second. Because uh, the consequence, of course, is that uh, if you can't walk fast, it means you can't cross the road, or you cross the road and you're putting yourself in harm's way, because motorists will not stop, or may often uh, not stop. And this brings us to another issue. Um, because the planet is aging, uh, dementia rates are rising everywhere we look, uh, yeah, really in a, in a quite uh, marked way. And uh, this, uh, the, the number of dementia cases in Europe, for example, is expected to double uh, by approximately 2030 and double again by about 2050. Um, and the question is, can we do anything to forestall uh, those changes in dementia, or, or that, that expected rise in dementia? So I, I just want to mention this very important study in The Lancet from a couple of years ago. Uh, what they do is focus on the modifiable lifestyle factors that can reduce the risk that somebody is going to succumb to dementia. And the estimate in this paper is that about one third of dementia cases could be prevented by lifestyle modifications. In other words, changes in what we do. And sitting in the middle of all of these is activity, exercise. So there's lots of other things you can do. Uh, don't smoke, uh, it's very good. Uh, get your diabetes uh, treated. Uh, and have a Mediterranean diet, all of those kinds of things, be well educated, uh, all of those things matter. But at the core of the recommendation is uh, uh, that we need to design our societies to allow uh, people to engage in much more movement right throughout the course of life. And the estimate from the Lancet Commission is that we can reduce the number of dementia cases by approximately one third, uh, a little under one third, by adopting policy changes within society that facilitate these kinds of things. And at the core of these has to be a focus on ensuring people move more. And do that consistently, early in life, right through to later in life. Does this prescription have an effect on the brain? Is it, or is this just hand -wrangling? Well, the answer is it does have an effect on the brain. Um, so this is a, a great study from our Kramer's group in Chicago. And what they do in this study is they take 120 people in their late 60s or early 70s, divide them into two groups, one who are brought for a walk three times a week for a year, and a group that are just left alone. Um, they're, they're, they're given the same amount of social contact, but they're not brought out for any exercise. And uh, what you see in the group that walk is an increase in the volume of the brain area, the hippocampus in this case, uh, that are concerned with learning and memory. So the average 72-year-old conclusion of this study has a performance equivalent to that of a 68-year-old. And that's really, really quite a remarkable gain from a, a very low-impact uh, 
intervention. Not alone that, but factors in the blood uh, that reflect plastic changes in the brain, like brain derived neurotrophic factor, and those kinds of things are, are all amplified. <coughs> and this brings us, I suppose, in a way, to a, a very fundamental problem. Why do we have a brain at all? And, and, and a different way of thinking about it is, what problems does having a brain solve? And uh, we can go back into the water, and uh, we can look at this very interesting creature, the uh, sea squirt. Uh, this is a larval sea squirt, in other words, a juvenile, and it's got a spinal cord, as you can see, running out of its, uh, its rear here. It's got a nice spot at the front. Uh, it's got a fin at the end of its spinal cord, and it can swim along in the water. And uh, if uh, you look at it in cross-section, you can tell up from down, so it has a, a, a little uh, uh, marble in its gut that uh, moves around, and when it's placed in the bottom, the animal knows that its stomach is uh, towards the, the ground, and it has this, uh, as I said, spinal cord, uh, which puts it in the same phylum as of we humans, because we have spinal cords as well. Uh, it has an eye, uh, and lots of other things that make it uh, somewhat uh, comparable to other vertebrate species or other species of its spinal cord. Um, but as it matures, it does something weird. Um, it finds <coughs> a rock, and uh, what was its mouth uh, is now used, or it uses its mouth to stick itself to a rock. And over a period of a few weeks, it uh, undergoes a dramatic change in its morphology. So its shape changes. And one of the first things it does, once it's firmly stuck to the rock, is it absorbs its own brain uh, and uses it as a needle. Now, is there a lesson from this for humans? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> um, suppose you're a little bit sea squirt. Uh, you like to be like a mumper you know, flop around. Uh, how good or bad is that for your physical health? Uh, you're going to guess that it's bad. Uh, I think that's reasonable. Um, but we can look at actually in detail how bad it is for your health. Uh, so this is a, a uh, you can see here's our homer uh, here in a waterbed. Uh, and these are uh, healthy young males in their late 20s or early 30s. And they're placed in this waterbed for three days. They're <coughs> here, obviously, to do this. And they only leave the waterbed when they need a, a toilet break. And uh, there are lots of measures that are taken of uh, muscle function. And what you find in three days in healthy males is uh, muscle volume goes down, muscle strength goes down, and the, the kind of elastic properties of the muscle changes for the worse. Uh, in as few as three days. Uh, in other words, being bed bound or being couch bound is actually uh, bad for you. Uh, Homer's lifestyle is, is uh, not a lifestyle you should adopt. Okay, now let's just kind of bring a few themes together. Uh, our world is aging, but our world is ur urbanizing. It's urbanizing at a really rapid rate. Uh, I love this picture, I think it's a really beautiful one. It shows you. Uh, uh, all the centers of population in uh, Eurasia and North Africa at night. And if you look at the fraction of the population of all of these countries, or, and every country in terms of how many people are living in urban centers, what we found is that by 2017, so just two years ago, the majority of the population of the world now live in towns and cities uh, and villages, so urban areas more generally. And this means in turn that uh, our walking is going to be urban. Uh, and I do not believe that our urban planners have actually faced up to the consequences of this, that first of all, people in our towns and cities are aging, and people are living in our towns and cities and will be walking more in those towns and cities. And um, this is a lesson from 300 years ago. Our streets used to be terrible for walkers. Uh, this is a poem by John Day in London. People used to empty, empty their chamber pots out of windows because the public health problem, sewers, or a solution hadn't been constructed. And this is why even uh, around the city you'd see many uh, food scrapers um, uh, into uh, urban, or sorry, into the, uh, the, the uh, entrances to Georgian houses. But I think our streets are still terrible for walkers. So anybody recognize the city? Galway, of course it's Galway, you should know it. Yeah, I see it right from originally. This is Galway Cathedral, uh, here's the car. And uh, uh, 
Gaul is trisected, if not quadrisected, by the River Carl. Uh, there's lots of bridges and uh, rivers in it. And at the western approaches, the town planners have inserted this wonderful junction. And to get from here as a pedestrian to here takes 14 minutes because they haven't bothered to put in any crosswalks or walkways. There are no traffic crossing points here. The only thing that matters is managing pedestrian flow in favor of cars. Um, uh, and this is, I think, a, is a, a fundamental design problem. People are not going to leave their cars and walk because it's dangerous. Um, and pedestrians are, are uh, uh, placed in a, in a very bad position as a result of it. It gets better or worse depending on the way you look at it. Uh, this is the Spanish Arch. I'm sure some of you at least have been there. And to get to the Spanish Arch from the so-called Latin Quarter in Gaula, you have to cross the road. And uh, one of the local councillors last year raised the concern that the pedestrian crossing of the Spanish Arch was causing daily backlogs of traffic on the Latin Quarter Road. <laughs> so people go to Gaula to go to the Spanish Arch. Uh, and tourists do this. But those damn tourists are equally causing traffic jams because they will insist on crossing the road. And <laughs> the proposal we put to the council was that the uh, traffic crossing be removed. <laughs> Figure that one out. I don't know how you do that. Um, in other words, the conclusion I want to give you is that pedestrians are usually, or very often, more than favorite motorists. But if you look at what people vote on as their favorite places in Dublin, uh, for example, these are places that people walk around together, they can engage in social walking. Uh, and the same is true in Galway. Uh, people love to walk around together. They don't go to admire the Font Junction. They don't go to admire the uh, uh, Red Cow. Uh, they come to places <laughs> where uh, they can be together uh, and enjoy a social walk. Uh, so this is uh, Taormina in Sicily, and uh, what I uh, want to do is really finish on this note. Um, one of the wonderful traditions that they have in it is uh, the, the passeggiata in the evening, uh, where people go out and walk together uh, to be seen, to see others, and to talk and engage in, in social conversation. Um, and what I want to do is, is suggest that at the core of the solution for the problems that arise as a result of our lack of movement is a need to redesign the principles on which we construct our towns and cities. Um, and, uh, here's an easy acronym for the urban planners to remember, uh, which is EASE. Uh, our towns and cities should be easy for everyone to walk. Uh, they should be accessible to all. And that means also people who are mobility impaired, people with visual impairments, and other problems that uh, would otherwise uh, restrict them from getting around. So this means designing footpaths, crossing points, a whole variety of things. Uh, our towns and cities should be safe uh, for everyone, so that means we should not mix pedestrians and, and traffic if we can help that at all. And finally, why do we live in towns and cities? Let's enjoy them. Uh, our towns and cities should be